at C4, we've been talking a lot recently about the landscape approach and determining exactly what that means uh, in practice, including in terms of the institutional arrangements and the tools that we use to manage and protect the environment is really one of the challenges that falls to us. Uh, and in this new paper on global environmental change, uh, Daniel Arbuthnot Fries from the National University of Singapore and my colleagues from uh, Eneco Garmendia and Eric uh, Gomez Baguetun. We pose the question of what happens when we attempt to contextualize one of these conservation schemes in this broader biophysical landscape. And we focus specifically on payment for ecosystem services schemes, PES, things as, as we know particularly well at C4, things like RED schemes that seek to incentivize the conservation of uh, forest carbon stocks, but also examples like in the UK where in efforts to protect biodiversity, incentives are being leveraged to encourage farmers to reduce uh, livestock densities and, and uh, fertilizer inputs. There's a huge amount of effort and investment that we're putting into trying to get these schemes just right. Well, how do we design them? What are the considerations that we need to integrate? And in this paper, we argue that we need to do a better effort to consider the biophysical landscape uh, within which these schemes are situated. Uh, to integrate the realities of things like fire, uh, stochastic weather events, hurricanes, invasive species, uh, sea level rise. We, in our paper, look at bro across a broad range of these, what we're calling external biophysical stressors, and first present a typology. Uh, defining these based on their origin, their spatial and temporal dimensions, and argue that we need to consider these factors as we design PES schemes. Uh, because we argue that although under-recognized, they have significant implications. Uh, for example, in the Amazon, where there are red schemes, red type uh, PES schemes emerging, the issue of fire has gained increasing amounts of attention. Because fire has very direct and tangible implications for the target ecosystem services that our PES schemes are interested in. Uh, biodiversity, carbon, these are direct, measurable uh, impacts. But also less linear and long-term impacts. Uh, fire, for example, affects the regeneration and species composition uh, of these sites, which have implications for future carbon and biodiversity values. They also affect the surrounding landscape. Uh, affecting, for example, decreased productivity in the surrounding landscape, increased incidences of fire in the surrounding landscape. In our paper, we provide a number of different examples. Another uh, case in which we highlight the relationship between external biophysical stressors and uh, ecosystem service provision for PES is in the Mississippi Delta. And this is a case in which uh, the Delta, you know, is, is subject to a range of different stressors. Uh, reduced sediments from upstream, uh, marine and fluvial pollution, hurricanes, subsidence uh, in the land surface as a result of oil and gas extraction, uh, as well as more local stressors, uh, drainage canals, uh, changes in the sediment and nutrient uh, inputs from the local area. Now these represent a really diverse range of biophysical stressors uh, in terms of origin, spatial and temporal dimensions. But importantly, the evidence suggests that the site is highly vulnerable, the delta is highly vulnerable to external stressors. Between 1955 and 1978, uh, only 16% of habitat loss in the delta could be directly attributed to local and direct stressors. Meaning that the majority of habitat loss over this, what, 25 or so year period was the result of activities that we're beyond the parameters of what we might consider the delta, beyond the parameters of what a site manager, a PES manager in the delta, might consider his or her responsibility. And this has had tremendous impact on the ecosystem and thus on its ability to provide target services, notably, for example, uh, coastal protection. And as a result, uh, very recently, the Louisiana Flood Protection Authority Filed, uh, filed a lawsuit against 97 oil and gas companies as a result of damages to the ecosystem service and to the provisions that are valued by society. Not only that, degradation of the delta system has also resulted, uh, affected its ability to store and sequester carbon 
and gradual degradation of the delta is now resulting in greenhouse gas emissions estimated in value at about $30 million per year. So it becomes immediately evident that as soon as we start to consider external biophysical stressors, in some cases we're talking about quite considerable drivers of change. And so if we're interested in designing a PES scheme that seeks to protect these ecosystem services, the question is, where do these external stressors play into our PES scheme? And we argue that they actually complicate PES quite significantly, or can at least. First, for example, they complicate our ability to define the ecosystem service that we're targeting to include in our, in our scheme. We might, for example, institute a PES scheme that does a great job at protecting a forest uh, from degradation or deforestation in order for, to protect its, its carbon stocks. Uh, or we might protect the deltaic wetland uh, to protect uh, you know, coastal protection services. But the question is, where these are subject to external biophysical stressors that inhibit their ability or limit or degrade their ability to provide the services we want, the question is, so what service are we paying for? And how site-based is that service? Should we also be paying, incentivizing for changes in behavior for these external stressors? And if so, which stressors? Of course, as we start to think about what service we're paying for, this introduces new monitoring requirements. In the case of carbon and red, we've thought and, and, and insisted that monitoring, reporting, and verification of the carbon stock is utmost in terms of importance to the function of this PES scheme. Well, if we can demonstrate that an external stressor is impinging on that service that we want, do we also have to monitor that external stressor? And if so, which one's yes, which one's no, and how? We further argue that external stressors also interrupt our, or, or complicate our ability to identify the participants in a PES scheme. Of course, in a PES scheme, we want to identify service beneficiaries who provide the incentives for conservation, as well as the, the um, service providers who are responsible for managing the land in a way that continues to provide the target ecosystem services. But again, if the service that we're interested in is actually contingent on an upstream or an up, up, upstream actor, what is their involvement in the parameters of our PES scheme? And also, what are the risks that external stressors present to participants? Whether it's a fire that might impinge a community forest or sea level rise that might, might impinge on, on a coastal protection project. Another dimension, of course, of the PES scheme is the mechanism itself. It's an institutional arrangement between these providers and beneficiaries. Uh, and so it's intrinsically interested with the distribution of benefits, but also of responsibilities. And because potentially of the financial component, also of financial liabilities. And so if we are dealing in an ecosystem service that has a financial value and we're making contractual commitments, what happens if this is degraded by an external variable beyond the area of our immediate control? Moreover, how do we design our scheme as we start to increase the parameters to consider the broader set of actors that are impacting ecosystem uh, services, how do we integrate them into the scheme? How many more contracts do we have to negotiate? What does that do to the costs of operating PES and also transaction costs of PES? So I hope you're convinced that, that if we do try and integrate this, it does add some complexities. And the question is, well, what do we do about them? Well, the first is I think that we have a responsibility to, to recognize them. And as we start to think more about landscapes, to place our PES schemes, which are often site-based, into this broader context. But this requires more steps. Uh, at, at, at basic, it requires evaluating uh, what these external stressors are and what are the vulnerabilities of these different target services to these external stressors. Some may be too slow uh, in terms of their, you know, the periods of impact or too diffuse that we may decide that they're not of target interest within our scheme. But others may in fact be of immediate, much more short-term and direct interest. There are environmental impact assessments, uh, ecosystem service provision models that allow us to think about this so we can start to identify but also prioritize what types of stressors are significant concerns and which aren't. And for those that are, there's a need to begin to consider how can we mitigate these? 
That might involve identification of broader participants. In a PS scheme, of course, we identify service providers and beneficiaries, but this broader approach may require broader mapping exercises to consider what types of stressors do we need to attribute and what possible human actors are behind those that we need to incorporate into our scheme. But this fundamentally is a move away from a very site-based approach to PES to a much more landscape-based approach, which of course, as in other environmental management uh, approaches, uh, that, that change in scope is incredibly complicated institutionally uh, in terms of costs, in terms of cross-sectoral planning. But the reality is, as we in our several case studies in our paper started mapping out the external stressors, uh, many of these are probably beyond the parameters of what an NGO or a community forest or a government agency is likely to be able to manage and integrate into planning. And I think we also need to be realistic about what types of external stressors we simply can't include. And where that's the case, not neglecting them, but in fact then, if we can't mitigate, seeking to accommodate. Well, what would accommodation look like? Well, it could take a number of different faces, but the one that we focus on is the accommodation of risk. We have people that are participating in these uh, schemes, linking livelihoods, making financial investments into these schemes. And where those risks exist, we need to consider areas where they can be, where can, they can be adjusted. Uh, whether this is akin to crop insurance, there's been increasing discussion about uh, PES types of insurance to, to, to accommodate those types of risks. Credit buffers in the case of RED to make sure that uh, participants are made less vulnerable and have something to fall back on if something like an external stressor impacts the provision of the service that they're responsible for. But overall, what it highlights is that what may seem like an effort to overcomplicate a red mechanism is perhaps, perhaps, well, hopefully not that. Because I think that these external stressors actually, in some cases, have much more profound implications than we've acknowledged. For example, if we're working with a forest-based community, effectively encouraging them to change livelihood strategies from a direct use of forests to different types of livelihoods that include PES and conservation of forests in exchange for different types of financial or non-financial incentives. But if their attachment of a livelihood, if their change in livelihood is towards a scheme that is vulnerable to these external stressors, what does that mean in terms of their personal livelihood vulnerability? These external stressors also may seem in some cases very marginal very slow, very gradual, but in some cases they involve quite large scale and quite significant costs. The Great Barrier Reef offers a perfect example. Over the last couple of years, a PES type mechanism has been used to incentivize uh, changes in soil management in the rivers that are introducing soil and nutrients uh, in downstream that are affecting the Great Barrier Reef. In over two years, fluvial sediment loads have been reduced for about, at about 6% but at a cost of about $72 million. The cost of mitigating external stressors can be significant. It's been estimated that the cost of mitigating or of offsetting one dredge spoil site at Abbott Point in Australia in order to protect the Great Barrier Reef from external stressors could be about a billion dollars. So what we're learning increasingly is that PES has uh, the potential to serve as an arrangement that helps us to align our social and environmental objectives. But like other environmental management strategies, they face a number of complexities when we start to think about practice, and particularly when we move from site-based to more landscape-based thinking. Moreover, when we think about these types of external stressors, what we note is that perhaps PES in some contexts really may not be appropriate. In, ecosystem serve, in ecosystems that are highly vulnerable to external stressors, what does PES offer us? For example, a mangrove that in the coming decades fe uh, faces significant threats from sea level rise, or a target forest site that's surrounded by drained peatlands that are incredibly flammable, that we can anticipate, we evaluate our external stressor, we know that they're likely to burn, that it's likely to impinge on ecosystem service function there. Uh, in a very sensitive biodiversity hotspot, the South African Fainbos, for example, which is highly vulnerable to invasive species. What is the potential for a PES mechanism there when the stressors are external to the parameters? What can PES offer us? And I think that as we start to think about these mechanisms more and more and what they offer us, we need to think, we need to recognize that there are some conditions, there are some ecosystem services, there are some sites where they're appropriate, but there's others where perhaps they may not be. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very, very much, Thanks, Jacob. Um, uh, 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 talk, uh, uh, paper was really quite broad implications, so I assume that we're going to have quite a broad spectrum of questions. Um, I was asked to ask you that when you ask a question to please stand up so you too can become a star on the, on the recording that's going to come out of this. I've been told that I have to stand on the X. So uh, please, is, uh, I'd like to open the floor to any questions. Please, Daniel. So please stand up and grab the microphone. Rising star. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, thank you, uh, Jacob. I'm glad you mentioned about the wetland. Uh, as you may know, yesterday was the World Wetland Day, and we, we tried to put up the blocks and everything we have been doing in C4 in, in a more organized way. But um, more specifically, I was going to ask about the extra stressor in the uh, mangrove ecosystem, which is very, very much uh, way apart beyond the reach of the local provider of, of environmental services, like the market of fish and restaurant in Europe, in Japan. How can we think about you know, uh, engaging these particular processes? and be put in the, in the equation of ecosystem services in the coastal zone. Thank, Thank you, you, Daniel. Actually, this paper started, well, so, so, so my co-author co uh, and the lead author, Daniel Fries, is a, is, a, is a coastal scientist. And he's particularly interested in the emergence of blue carbon, which is effectively you know, the use of, of, of payment for ecosystem services and our interest in red and its application to ecosystems such as mangroves and, and seagrass beds which can store you know, surprising amounts of carbon. And the question of can we use this instrument that was designed initially with terrestrial ecosystems in mind in, in the coastal and marine zone. And our initial thoughts are bio, because, well, marine systems, we argue, and coastal systems are, are different than terrestrial systems. Water changes things. The interconnectedness of these systems makes an attempt to implement PES between a European fish consumer and a mangrove manager, all the more complicated because these systems are so dependent on sea level rise, on nutrient and sediment uh, inputs, whether they're deprived of sediments or whether there's you know, excess being introduced. Uh, and our conclusion is that in some contexts, it may be misguided to try and force these different types of services into schemes that are perhaps not well suited. Uh, but in cases where they are, we, we need to try and, as we mentioned, mitigate and accommodate. Dan has a great example of uh, mangrove in Singapore. Not many left, but some very important ones in terms of, for example, migratory bird paths, um, uh, local tourism value and recreational value. And these are sites, you know, Singapore has the governance capacity, has the resources to manage these sites in ways that few countries do. And yet, Despite great management uh, at the site-based level, the mangroves continue to, de to degrade. Uh, they're, you know, the sea level rise, you know, they've been fenced in on one side by urban development. On the other side, there's legitimate concerns of sea level rise uh, and also changes in sediment inputs. And so the question is, could payment for ecosystem services work at that site? No, I don't think so. And I think Dan's conclusion is quite similar. But could there be arrangements that involve activities in neighboring Malaysia, in Johor, that could perhaps have implications for Singapore? Yes, but of course, now we start talking about not a site-based PES, but in fact, in this case, a transnational PES that has some really significant and complex institutional requirements. So not impossible, but definitely not easy. Okay, thank you. Any other? While you think of your questions, can I ask you a question? Perhaps not very well formulated, but you speak about um, a sort of solutions being um, changing scales, um, taking a landscape a sort of approach or a broader governance approach. What about temporal scales? You know, I, I, I sort of feel that many of these schemes are really based on an idea of real static nature, which often doesn't happen. What about sort of trying to expand um, 
uh, temporal scales so that some of these stressors um, are subsumed sort of in a longer area of, of uh, well, maybe not stability, but um, you know, not going way past the, 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 the parameters that one might want to, to um, um, preserve. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's absolutely the issue. And, and, it's, and I think it's a broader question about PES. Is PES a solution forever? Is it a stopgap measure until something else happens, until we become better resource managers? Uh, or is the idea that there's going to be a, a transfer of benefits indefinitely? Uh, for red, we see that most schemes are, you know, or were projected, what, 15 or 20 years. Uh, in the case of fire, you know, fire is an immediate concern within the next 15 or 20 years. But some of these other stressors are uh, much more insidious. They're slower. They ha can have synergistics and synergistics, additive, cumulative effects. Uh, but they may not be manifest in the next five or ten years in ways that we're immediately concerned about. So if you're an investor in carbon for the next ten-year horizon, do you care about that stressor? N no. Um, but w we presumably are interested in protecting these ecosystems uh, not on decadal scales and much broader ones. So the question is how does that, how does that jive with the fact that many of these changes are, are not immediate? Um, and are not even, in some cases, especially where water is involved, not even necessarily visible to the naked eye and so difficult for participants to really appreciate. Uh, in these cases, I would argue that we have a tool that, at least to date, is comparatively short-sighted trying to deal with problems that are much more long-term. Doesn't mean that it can't be, but I think that you hit on the issue, which is that we need to start to think about <coughs> what are we expecting of these PES schemes in terms of their duration. This is really an issue that has come up, for example, with the case for biodiversity. There's a lot of people saying that biodiversity is intrinsically important to red, uh, to forest carbon, because if we don't protect biodiversity in a forest, uh, eventually it will change the structure of that forest, which will change its ability to provide carbon. Yeah, but not in the next 10 years, not the, probably not in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. I mean, we can have, we can have forests that have, you know, not a single animal left in them, but still can sequester and store carbon for, you know, tens and tens of years. But if we're interested in the resilience and the health and the carbon sequestration potential of these forests for the next hundreds of years and longer, then of course biodiversity becomes important. But it's all an issue of, in that case, of temporal scale. May I just follow that up? I'm expecting that hands will come up really soon. May I just f follow that up just for a second? What I also meant was, you know, you have a fire sweeps through and then, and that, that sends up a lot of the carbon up or does some other things, but then next year it all starts growing back. Are we incorporating that kind of, of uh, ability to see sort of temporal, temporal fluctuation or, um, you know, as I suspect, are we actually trying to, uh, to, to use very, very strict and very short-term temporal scales in order uh, in our in enforcement? I, I mean, I think you're spot on. I think we're using very static tools to manage very dynamic uh, <coughs> systems, not only ecologically dynamic, but also systems that are dynamic in terms of changing opportunity costs of land, dynamic in terms of land uses. You know, there's, there's, I think there's quite a, there's, well, there's a number of reasons, but I think that's one of the reasons that, for example, Sweden agriculture hasn't proved a great match for, for, for red. Yes, there are potentials to manage Sweden as part of dynamic ecosystem services that maintain social objectives, biodiversity objectives, carbon, but it's very dynamic and that's complicated. It's much easier to protect one large protected area that we consider static and fortressed than it is to try and incorporate these, these high complexities. Thank you, you couldn't have used a better example. <laughs> Please, uh, Christoph, I think is next. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Uh, it's really interesting to, to, to learn about these external stressors and, um, you know, how can they impact uh, the past projects. Uh, but, you know, if you, um, you mentioned RED, so I'm going to kind of focus on that. If you, if you look at how RED has been sort of implemented, and uh, in Indonesia, for example, how they went about implemented RED, you kind of notice a, a uh, kind of a reverse logic, you know, where at the beginning, you know, ca some years back, you, you kind of have this kind of broad approach to RED, <coughs> trying to kind of take, take note of these different external factors and so on at the national level. And then as, as authorities and other players involved in RED kind of realize the complexities involved, then they, they kind of uh, 
retreated from this kind of broad approach to red and kind of started focusing more on this so-called jurisdictional approach where you kind of focus on specific areas and specific uh, administrative units. So um, I don't know, what do you make of this? Are they kind of locking themselves into some kind of uh, undefendable little places where, you know, and, and, and sort of uh, kind of setting themselves up for for disappointment or failure or something like that. You know, there are, there are numerous examples of these projects, TNC and other places. I, th I think that's a great, I think that's a great point because we of course need to place our PES schemes not only in a biophysical context, which is what we're focused on in this paper, but also in a governance context. And, you know, a landscape approach uh, may sound very attractive for all sorts of reasons, but institutionally, as you point out, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, and so we're tied between what we should do or what we think we should do and what we can do. And I think in the case of RED, you know, this is the way we've gotten around that, perhaps somewhat conveniently, is by calling it a nested approach, uh, which I think is great, saying, you know, because of the institutional barriers, we need to start small uh, because that's what we can manage, that's what's feasible, but this is part of some broader reality. I don't have any, any magic answers for, for what's going to link those two things. I don't think they're problems that are unique to RED or unique to PES. Uh, I think these are much broader challenges, and I think that as C4 engages more with what it means to deal with landscapes, the institutional complexities of that are going to be huge. Now, if we do choose a nested approach and start small and scale up, which sounds great, that, that's fine, but we, we have to make sure that we scale up from the site base to something bigger, and I think we need to also be candid that we are going to run into possibly some cases where our small-scale approach, driven by institutional needs or funding needs, does contend with these biophysical realities which, which may limit uh, the outcomes, uh, often in ways that we're not pleased with. Great. Thanks for your talk. Um, I like your critical view of, of RED and you know, what alternatives we should consider in certain contexts. I would say that even at the site-based, at the site level, there are plenty of examples where RED is, is will not, may not work, or PES may not work, I should say. PES is not new. Community-based wildlife management has been around for quite a while in, in Africa in particular, where they've attempted essentially to do PES before it was called that. And it really relied on having sufficient payments. I mean, make the payment large enough, both in terms of uh, community-based institutional or infrastructural development as well as individual payments, but there are plenty of examples where it didn't work and that was very site-specific simply because the incentives weren't, weren't strong enough and there were other competing incentives. Um, so I, I think scale only further complicates that and I think, um, I think in there's, there are certification options that might be an alternative in some context, but I, I believe that the we need I, I personally feel that the love affair with financial incentives is, is getting a little bit weak. And uh, so can, you know, sp especially you sit in a governance program, uh, can you give us p your particular recommendations for areas for research that we should try to focus on to <laughs> ensure that landscape approaches, uh, while we can say nested approaches are, are great, that, they, that it's not captured or taken over by pest schemes, which ignore the gut which frequently really don't do justice to the governance constraints in their in their context i think we've in the case of red we've really recognized that you know the the we've moved a long way from the we need to make forests you know forests are not valuable unless they're cut down if we make them valuable they won't be cut down we've moved a long way from that point of origin i think that logic still stands but it stands as you point out in a much broader context ps uh, I think while we, you know, the d we have in many different sectors romanticized that the failures of the state to meet our social and environmental goals, whether it's in forests or in transportation uh, or in healthcare, can be replaced by market mechanisms. It, it, you know, market mechanisms are perhaps part of a solution, but they're certainly not a replacement. We've learned that across the board. Uh, so in the context of PES, I think that it really falls in, as you point out, into a broader governance context. And we can't just say, well, enforcement in this area is very low, so our protected areas are being degraded. We're going to replace that with incentives. I think time and time again, we're seeing that that's, it's just simply not viable. And I think that at an international level, the red policy response to that has been this idea of no regrets investments, which I think are very fair. But in fact, those aren't investments into incentives. Those are investments into more transparent, strengthened governance, 
into uh, better coordination across agencies. Recognizing that even in the context of incentives, the no regrets bit, the part that, that the underlying requirements are still there. Um, so in terms of research agendas, uh, as we continue to think about incentives and corporate social responsibility and all of these private and voluntary contributions, I just think that we need to keep a strong place at the table for the state um, as a regulator, as a, someone who maintains standards, uh, as, as, a, as a function that enforces rules, uh, as part of a broader governance mix. Because, yeah, as you point out, we've learned that incentives are great but incomplete. Thank you. Just, um the question I had follows on pretty well from what you just said regarding the, the, the potentially important role of the state. And uh, basically, uh, I think that what you're doing is really important, and thank you for bringing it to us, uh, looking at the, the um, importance of external stressors and how to, uh, and, and looking at alternative ways of mitigating them in the context of pest schemes. Um, and I, there's, there's something that I, it leaves me with a big question, and that is, um, well, obviously, how these schemes work from place to place are going to be very different because they're operating under very different government, government, governance um, uh, circumstances and also very different uh, types of markets and also different um, sort of social capacities uh, the, to, uh, to um, uh, develop very uh, advanced market mechanisms. So uh, the, the question that it leaves me with is when we're, when, is PES necessarily payment for ecosystem services? Is it also um, uh, payment for certain behaviors that should produce ecosystem services um, if uh, all, all, all else equal? And if that's the case, if you look at a large enough scale, such as a national scale, uh, at programs that are designed to, produ to, to <coughs> induce behaviors that produce ecosystem services, does it necessarily matter so much if here and there there are um, problems that result in those services being degraded or not being provided? Um, as long as the people who are doing their best to provide them are still taken care of for the efforts they're putting in and for the um, the efforts that they might make to mediate post uh, after such uh, negative or detrimental events occur. I, I mean, I think what, you, what you're proposing, I think, is a much more comprehensive and sane approach to trying to deal with complex environmental problems. Uh, the idea of paying, well, but, but, it's a, but you know, it's a long-standing debate. Are we paying for measurable ecological outcomes or are we paying for actions? You know, we've, we've, we've tried paying for actions for a long time too, and that has its own limitations. So, you know, the, the pendulum will swing. Uh, but one of the things, again, that we've learned is that the market logic of if you pay for it, it will be provided has some truth to it, but uh, the, the, line, the line looks linear when in fact it's, this is what it looks like. Um, uh, social equity dimensions, governance dimensions, uh, capacity, uh, you know, are, are what, you know, that's what those squiggles represent. Uh, what you're proposing, though, um, somehow, though, also runs contradictory to one of the tenets of payment for ecosystem services, which is conditionality. Uh, part of the reason that I believe PS emerged is in response to a dissatisfaction with providing donor support, conservation programs, and not seeing ecological outcomes in the ways that we wanted or expected, and trying to tie it more to results. I don't know if the people, the donors, the conservation groups, who have learned the hard lesson of paying for actions, and then have said, that's not good enough, we want to pay for outputs, outcomes. I don't know if they're ready to move back, not regressively back, but, but recognize that perhaps this wasn't the silver bullet. Uh, but what you're getting at, fundamentally, is something that in red we've already started to recognize, which is this entire startup phase. These no, these no regrets investments are absolutely critical uh, and, and will underlie any other efforts rather than, uh, rather than replace them. Thank you, um, Peter. And please remember to stand up. Yes. Oh, OK, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your talk. Um, I'm just trying to think ahead of the curve and, and uh, someone else what, what, what should 
the research agenda be about? And then I'm, I'm thinking like this, that you're describing PES as we have all traditionally seen it. Uh, you're describing some complexities that it typically works under very specific conditions when it can be defined and uh, you know, uh, bounded in and, and uh, some kind of, of payment situation can be developed. And then you mentioned high transaction costs and, and you, you, you end up in a fairly difficult situation in terms of making it a generally applicable thing to improve um, the planet, I guess. Um, so if we're now moving to a landscape thinking on this, I'm wondering, and it's an open question, I'm wondering, is it time to take the ecosystem services in the other direction and widen it? Because at the end of the day, food production is an ecosystem service too. That gets paid for. And if we're talking about making sure that we have capital flow going into investments in, in the ecosystems of all kinds, we can look at the, the market for biological food, which is exploding. And that is, in a way, an additional payment for those ecosystem services that we're after. So my question becomes, or my proposition becomes, that maybe it's time to turn around and expand the, the concept of those ecosystem services. I don't know. It's just a absolutely. I mean, j just a quick response. But I, I think that I think that you're absolutely right, and I think that a lot of the people, you know, uh, in the U.S. and in, in Europe, in the U.K., uh, where a lot of this ecosystem service thinking originated. Uh, you know, the cat got out of the bag. Uh, the, the terminology was proposed, it was negotiated with policymakers, it was made policy legible, and I think that in the process it went from a recognition of uh, complex socio-ecological systems and recognizing that ecosystems are different from certain services and that there's different values that we place on different services into something that became very deterministic and very narrow. Uh, and I think that, that the, you know, those original thinkers of ecosystem services would be very sympathetic to what you're saying in calling for a broader framing. Uh, what that means in practice, of course, would be challenged. There's a reason it became legible. There's a reason it was made simple. Uh, and that's because we have a necessity for, for simpler solutions. How we, how we rebroaden it, I don't know yet, but I think you're absolutely right to, to highlight that as a, as, a, as a future direction. Okay, thank you. Um, Miguel? And I then after that, we'll have time, I think, for another one or two questions. So please get ready. Let me know. My main problem is that this PA is still being framed within the box of conservation. It's just conservation and conservation and conservation. I think we should move outside the box of conservation and try to see how PAs can actually be part of the new paradigm of development, incorporating, as sometimes Peter told a long time ago, forestry into all land use activities. Um, I feel a bit guilty that I'm still working for some NGOs to maintain the private zoos. Um, I think we had to review that. The other one is we need to review the whole conceptual, uh, theoretical background. I don't call typologies. Stressors, probably there, but you also have inhibitors of ecosystem function that we also have to look at that. Where are the, where are the balance? And if you have, it's not just stressors. I also, the dimension of change, I won't call stressors the amount or the number of um, sediments arriving into coastal areas when the dimension is enormous, the scale is enormous, it's not anymore um, a s small amount coming and gradually, incrementally changing. It's this is massive changes. We are into more conversion, large scale conversion. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, in terms of sediments, you're right. There's a, there's a history of, of, you know, gradual, gradual change, but in fact, what we're seeing is, is quite quite dramatic in some contexts. Uh, Mississippi Delta and, and, and Great Barrier Reef b are both cases where, where the changes are, you know, 70, 80 fold. Um, in terms of conservation, I mean, you're right. I, you know, many of these PES schemes have an origin in conservation. Uh, but I think that in practice, there's increased evidence that what we're seeing on the ground, not at the theoretical level, but on the ground, is much more linked to development agendas. Um, whether it's socio bosque, you know, integrating kind of, you know, poverty alleviation directly into the planning, uh, 
um, or in other places where there's recognition that even if we do want very narrow conservation objectives, we still have to consider a range of social variables, uh, not only distribution of benefits, but also how we engage people, what their priorities are, what they consider fair, and so on. Uh, and I think that that's at least a beginning of a reframing of PS within this broader uh, perspective that's not just narrowly conservation, but also part of a broader social enterprise. Um, in terms of integrating PS into, you know, across land uses and across sectors, I mean, I think that that's at least in principle what the green economy is thinking about in the forest sector, but the practicalities of that, uh, you know, as we've talked about before as a community, are still, are still challenging. Great. Aaron? return engagement as well and um, there is space for one more anybody who who would like to please let me know okay uh, I'd like to follow up on your comment about conditionality and that's a this essential tenant of PES um, and what limitations that might um, provide what that limitations that might provide for our ability to uh, derive solutions for to to ensure future resilience of ecosystems um, because any framework, and, and these are large-scale, more complex institutional frameworks, they inherently become quite rigid in terms of what, they, you know, what was the baseline and what are you measuring and, and at what scale should that conditionality be measured. Um, it suggests to me that like, in contrast to you know, the Northwest, in the U.S. and the Northwest uh, spotted owl conservation um, management plan that was planned over 20 years, I think, um, it was explicitly an adaptive management approach in which different parts of that whole region approached conservation very differently and, and included payments of different kinds to communities and or less payments. And reflecting kind of what I, why, what I interpreted comment from Louis, saying like should it be really, should, it be pay, should the payments be based on individual very site specific outcomes or should it be based on, uh, should there be greater flexibility for experimentation and even if it didn't result in that outcome here, there are lessons to be learned from that and then you know, let's not revise it immediately, t let, it, let it go for 10 years and then let's, let's see how we want to adjust it but rather that it's, it feels to me that a lot of pest schemes are very, the conditionality really kind of limits what governments at national, local levels can do wi uh, to, to... Well, and it's going to limit risk-taking, it's yep. going to limit uh, flexibility, it's going to limit willingness to renegotiate contracts. I don't think it's necessarily bad, however. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, I have mixed feelings on it, to be honest, but I think conditionality is important because it, it, you know, it, it links to accountability, which is, I think, a legitimate concern. Uh, that said, you know, I have called in other places for, for more adaptive uh, and adaptive management, but also adaptive learning approaches to PES. And I think it's absolutely important. We don't know how these schemes work in practice. In fact, we don't understand. We don't know what social variables do and don't matter. We don't know governance context. We don't know what external stressors matter and which don't. And if we take a very, you know, predetermined approach to it, then you know, we're, we're perhaps shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, that said, I think that we need to maintain a place at the table for conditionality. And we also need to make sure that uh, we don't learn the lessons, you know, we're learning, we're, we're learning lessons about PES that in 10 years we'll forget, but we also need to make sure that we don't forget the lessons of what we learned previously from environmental management and conservation schemes in terms of, you know, bolstering, gov you know, strengthening governance or improving coordination or, or improving protected areas coverage. There have been a lot of lessons there. We need to also be careful to not uh, totally fall back on that. But I think adaptive integrating, what does adaptive governance look like and what does adaptive learning look like within PES is something that we haven't really yet, I think, considered very much. Thank you very, very much. I'd like to thank Jacob one more time for this great um, encore performance and we look forward to number three. Thank you. Thanks to you.